Yeah. Since we're since we're short on time, we'll do the uh, physiological sigh one that we practiced. So it's just again, if everyone remembers, a big inhale through the nose to fill up your lungs, and then squeeze in a bit more air, and then you can let it out quietly, slowly, or with a nice big sigh. <sighs> we'll do two more. One more. <sighs> All right. Thanks. Mike, thank you for that. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, to those who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, for those who are sticking around, thank you so much. Um, I think I said this before Brad's talk, but it's really an overwhelming feeling. Uh, to know that people have stuck around online virtually for three days. And I, I'm seeing a lot of familiar names and faces and it's, it's really great. Um, we're a small team. We haven't really run a lot of conferences before, but the fact that you're, you're still here, you're putting up with us, you're putting up with me and my, my rambling and Mike and Jen, it's, it's a real honor. So in the spirit of gratitude, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think this panel really builds on nicely from Brad's excellent discussion. And Brad, again, thank you for sticking around with us. So this should be a nice follow on to your, your conversation about organizational culture. Brad really set the stage for, um, uh, I see my name in the chat. So now Mike, you've distracted me. I don't even know what the rest of that sentence says, but I'll keep going. So Brad laid out a really nice vision for what an effective, healthy, psychologically safe, high-performing organizational culture um, ought to consist of. Um, the question that I was thinking about throughout, Brad, throughout Brad's excellent talk is how do you get there? What are some practical things that you and the audience HR professionals can do to contribute to um, a more positive sort of DNA, a more positive system just environment, a cultural, a set of norms and habits and practices that really inform what you do every day as you interact with your colleagues and as you put together products and projects and presentations. Um, one major tool these days to improve organizational culture is diversity training. Now, um, we know from uh, Professor Frank Dobbins' uh, talk yesterday that diversity training has a long history. It's It's rooted in the 1960s civil rights movement, but today it's been it's it's all the rage. It's everywhere. Organizations of, of a variety of different uh, shapes and sizes are rolling out different diversity training programs. Um, and the the stated objective of these programs is to really to improve organizational culture, to make organizations less biased, less discriminatory, more inclusive, more psychologically safe, um, to allow Different individuals of diverse backgrounds, especially those coming from historically marginalized groups, to bring their full selves um, to the workplace without fear of being microaggressed or being the victims of implicit bias. Um, the question that we want to probe is whether this diversity training tactic, this tool to enhance organizational culture, actually works. Um, we heard a bit about that from Frank Dobbin yesterday, and this is a, an excellent way to continue on to that conversation, but really assessing whether this tactic is, is working um, and whether or not it might actually be contributing to, to some negative unintended consequences. It might be well-intended, but it might have, ne have negative effects. To help us understand what diversity training is, where it comes from, the effects it has on, on, on organizational culture across a number of different dimensions, and also potentially how to do diversity work more effectively. It, it's my honor to, to introduce Musa Al Garbi. Uh, Musa is a, um, a sociologist at Columbia University, and he's also a, a columnist for The Guardian US. Uh, he's a very prominent public intellectual, so much so that a leading American magazine referred to him as the last academic who can tell the truth. Um, I think Musa, I, I told you in this in a previous conversation, I took offense to that. I, I, I'm trying to be an academic who can tell the truth, but 
it, it's an honor to have you here with us. Um, Musa, Musa is the is the author of a number of really important works. He's an expert on race and inequality and, and discourse. Um, he's written two excellent pieces that we will send out um, after the conference for the Heterodox Academy on, the, on diversity training, really outlining what the research says. It's a really excellent piece uh, or two pieces on, on what the research says about diversity training efficacy and also what the research says about what works. Um, He's also the author of the forthcoming book. Uh, let me get the title right. We have never been woke social, social justice discourse, inequality and the rise of a new elite with Princeton University Press. Uh, sounds like a fascinating book and I know it touches on a lot of the topics uh, we'll, we'll touch on today. So Musa, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I think maybe the first thing I'd ask you is what is what is diversity training? Where does it come from? Why is this thing so so popular today? Where where what is this phenomenon all about? Sure. Um, so I mean, if you already had Frank Dobbin on, I don't want to be too redundant. He's really like fantastic. Okay, but um, but one thing that I'll say is, but but to like briefly overview, uh, there are some early versions of diversity training. Um, uh, like um, there was the formation of what was called T groups and the development of like sensitivity training that actually goes all the way back to the late 1940s um, and uh, started to build up, um, became more popular in the uh, mid to late 60s. The first like um, firm that was created to uh, to do diversity training was called Pacific Management Systems. It was created in 1967 by a gentleman named Price Cobb. Um, uh, but, but really, um, the impetus, uh, but diversity training didn't really take off, didn't really become a, a huge deal until the mid eighties to the early nineties. So when you really started seeing this huge expansion in diversity training, and the reason you saw this expansion was a few reasons. So one, one reason is, uh, starting in the late seventies to the early eighties, universities started enrolling a lot more women and minorities. Um, people from middle and lower class backgrounds, uh, as a result of changes in the law, um, as a result of um, changing university, um, changing funding structures and things like this. So you had much more diverse group of people going into college, and then they would graduate college. <laughs> they, were going, they wanted jobs, of course. Um, and so they were entered. So you had this much more diverse cohort of people entering the workforce. Um, uh, and um, and so a lot of employers found themselves with a much more heterogeneous labor pool all of a sudden. Um, and so they had to face for the first time in many cases, um, some of the challenges that come with the benefits of diversity, right? Um, so you had people with divergent backgrounds, divergent perspectives, divergent life experiences, working side by side for, for common goals. Um, and at first there were huge blowups, there was a lot of lawsuits, there was a lot of turnover. Um, and so, um, and then layered on top of these kind of pressing organizational challenges that companies were dealing with um, for, with respect to productivity and things like this and, and retainment, there were changes in the law um, that, that um, so, you know, there was uh, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, there were executive orders like um, affirmative action, there were Supreme Court rulings like Adams v. Richardson that finally formally desegregated colleges in 1973. Um, and, uh, and so there were all these new workplace, um, these new rules and regulations that companies had to comply with as well. And a lot of the laws that were passed were actually kind of vague, like it wasn't clear uh, what it meant to comply um, with the rules. Um, and so you had the development, and this is when you really started seeing the proliferation of HR professionals as well, who were um, doing that, like figuring out what does it mean <laughs> to, to put these, um, these uh, requirements that were like, what does that mean in practice, right? Uh, and so as they're trying to sort through these, this more diverse workforce and comply with these new rules and regulations, um, a lot of companies reached for, um, for this training that had been developed um, that, that purported to be able to help groups, help people from different backgrounds collaborate together and overcome their differences and things like this. Um, the problem was there wasn't a lot of research on whether or not uh, whether or not 
that training was effective because and it hadn't been most of this most of these training programs they had, they had been you know um, pretty experimental carried out kind of small scale and all of a sudden they were put in all sorts of companies nationwide at a huge scale um, in very in like practical settings not in like you know in small groups or um, uh, in, in controlled experiments things like this uh, and so it was widely implemented starting in the late uh, 80s. Uh, mid 80s and early 90s. And then over the decades that followed though, um, it started to become increasingly obvious that some of the problems that the training was supposed to solve didn't seem like they were being solved. There was still a lot of conflict. There was still a lot of turnover. A lot of um, organizations were still not diverse. There were still lawsuits. There were still bad PR happening and things like this. And so um, uh, researchers started asking themselves like in becoming a lot more um, empirically oriented to figuring out, well, does this stuff actually work? Uh, and, the, and the picture that emerged from, um, from that research uh, program uh, hasn't been pretty <laughs> in many respects. Uh, but, but so that's, that's the big picture about sort of uh, how we got here. And, 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 uh, and as far as what the training is supposed to do, I'll add um, one problem with diversity training as it's currently practiced is that uh, it's not always clear what the training is supposed to be doing, like what concrete goals, because there are kind of a lot of goals that the that companies are hoping to achieve through the training. Um, so for instance, they wanna make sure they're complying with affirmative action and equal opportunity laws and to demonstrate their compliance in court if needed. Uh, they wanna um, protect themselves from lawsuits they want to improve productivity and cooperation within teams. They want to um, signal to employers and uh, employees and prospective employees that they're an institution that cares and is committed to doing something about different social justice problems. They want to signal to customers the same kind of thing that they're an organization that cares and is committed to, you know, um, they want to hire and retain a more diverse staff at various levels of the organizations and for a bunch of different reasons that they want diversity in their staff. Um, as well, um, and it's not even clear. In, in many cases, um, um, companies don't do a good job of explaining why they want diversity either. Um, but but there's a bunch of goals that they have for why they want diversity um, as well, uh, both as a legal compliance issue, as a PR issue uh, for companies and prospective employees to enhance productivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this whole list. Um, there's like a broad range of things that companies are trying to. Uh, accomplish with this tool, and uh, they're often not very clear or explicit about which specific thing, and there's, there's not a lot of tailoring that's happening. Like, this is the goal um, that we have. This is a specific concrete goal. The training is going to help us achieve this goal in this specific way. Like, there's not a tight relationship between the, um, the means and the ends, because the ends themselves are not clear. It's kind of a an all-purpose scattershot tool that's used to, to try to advance all of these goals at the same time. And it often ends up um, advancing none of them um, particularly effectively. Great, thanks Musa. So if I understand you correctly, diversity trainings origins are, are deeply rooted in say, I think you said the 1940s and 1960s, but really in the 70s and 80s when two things are happening, demo demographic changes to the, to the workplace, which is putting pressure on organizations to manage an increasingly diverse labor force, as you mentioned, and also legal changes that are requiring organizations to behave differently or to change some of their internal practices. I'm interested in, in the demographic, demographic change and what that actually meant for how um, organized sort of interpersonal dynamics in an organization would play out and what that sort of what, what we're seeing today in terms of some of the problems of a lack of a diversity in, in organizations in the private and public sector, in terms of race and discrimination. Uh, one of the first sessions we had on day one of the conference was about um, racism in the workplace and I guess more broadly, other forms of hatred and, and prejudice and discrimination. From your sense of things, um, what are you seeing in terms of um, discrimination, racism, bigotry in the workplace. What's that kind of problem like? I know that's the, maybe that's not a great way to word the question. Maybe you know what I'm getting at. What's the what's the nature of the problem here when it comes to racism and discrimination in the workplace? 
Yeah. So I mean, there's there's uh, the the sort of macro literature on some of this is kind of disappointing in 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 a lot of ways. So so on the one hand, um, there there are two things that are that are kind of happening at once. So on the one hand, kind of overt expressions of um, like racism or sexism or prejudice or whatever have become kind of taboo, and people people. Um, and not only is it not only is it taboo as in like people feel discomfort saying racist things out loud in public or whatever sexist things um, but uh it's also the case that a lot of people are you know feel actually committed in various respects and to various degrees i mean and this is one issue is that <laughs> but but committed on some level to the idea of racial justice the idea of feminism to the idea of um and especially within a lot of organizations that are um, affiliated with what you could call the knowledge economy or the symbolic economy. Uh, when you look at the political and ideological affiliations of the people who tend to work in these organizations, they're overwhelmingly kind of skew left, they're overwhelmingly sympathetic um, and view themselves as allies and things like this to the marginalized and the disadvantaged. And they want their companies to, to, that they work for to also um, share those values. But at the same time, uh, that there's this kind of change in, in, in attitudes um, and beliefs, and certainly in the way people talk and signal, um, there's been increasing inequality in the United States along a lot of lines. And there's been research that shows that um, uh, studies have found that um, uh, discrimination in the workplace doesn't seem to have changed much actually over the last 25 years the, the the gaps between blacks and whites today are basically the same as they were in the 19 the gaps between rich and poor are this basically the same as they were in the 60s um even gains for women have basically stalled out um after the 1990s um and uh and so uh and so there's this kind of and and actually and and, and one thing that's even more striking than that is that some of the institutions where people are the most expressly committed to diversity and inclusion, to feminism, to anti-racism, so these knowledge economy industries, they tend to be the most parochial, the most unequal, the least diverse um, compared to the rest of, of, of like, um, so for instance, people who are working um, uh, uh, in manufacturing or um, uh, uh, or as security guards or in um, like almost any field that you can imagine outside of the knowledge economy, <laughs> they tend to be a lot more diverse in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, they, turn, they tend to, um, uh, e even in terms of gender, um, uh, depending on the field, um, some, some of these fields, especially the more manual ones still skew heavily male, but a lot of them are even more equal. Um, and there's less, inequality between men and women actually like the, the the gaps between men and women in earnings tends to grow as people become more educated um so so in jobs that require a degree there's typically a bigger gap between men and women than in jobs that don't um and so there's this kind of interesting paradox where the people and in institutions that are sort of the most verbally committed to these ideals um, are often some of the most parochial and some of the most unequal in the entire economy. Interesting. That's, that's, it's a fascinating paradox. Um, to get it, okay. So before we dig into the, I guess this, this, the precise effects that these trainings have on an organization, could you walk us through what this sort of standard diversity training program looks like? What what are what is being said? Um, what's the content of it? Sure. So there's a lot of um, heterogeneity within diversity programs, but there's a few kind of um, things that a lot of them try to tick through. Um, so for instance, one big component of a lot of diversity programs, regardless of whether they're focused on gender or race or sexuality, and, and I'll, I'll add a lot of them are, a lot of training programs are oriented towards one of these things in specific, specifically, like they're separate modules for gender and sexuality, they're separate or, or for, gender and sexual harassment and things like this. There's separate modules for race uh, and, and racial discrimination uh, rather than there's separate modules sometimes for disability and things like this, right? And so they're, they're often kind of um, 
Okay, but regardless, uh, a lot of the training is focused on informing people about um, rules and laws and company procedures. Um, they help define things like discrimination and harassment and um, give people examples of behaviors that would count or as discrimination or harassment. They're kind of um, very compliance oriented. So <laughs> these are the red lines, don't do these things. These are the kind of punishments that could occur if you do these things. Um, so that's one component of a lot of um, diversity training. Um, uh, other, another component is that a good deal of the training includes kind of positive statements about the value of the diversity of, of diversity writ large and um, kind of the commitment of the company to diversity. Although, uh, again, they're often kind of distressingly nonspecific about, <laughs> about what, um, so diversity is good, um, but like not so concrete about why diversity is useful in this company for the things that we're doing. Um, so they're, they're kind of um, vague statements, but positive statements about diversity in general. Um, uh, there's a lot of focus on avoiding offense and on kind of avoiding conflict. Uh, um, and um, there's often, often the training provides people with basic information about race, gender, sexuality, disability, about different groups. Um, sometimes that training is inaccurate or essentializing, <laughs> um, uh, but but that's a big goal of it is to like, so if you're um, a man uh, who's not used to working with women, then you know, the training kind of provides you, provides some like an, a little bit of an overview about, uh, you know, um, or if you're a, a white person who's not used to working with say African-Americans and et cetera. Um, there's often an asymmetry in the training in terms of how it talks about different groups uh, in, in a couple of senses. So for, an, for one, um, the training tends to focus on, say, the um, accomplishments of historically disadvantaged and marginalized groups um, and the virtues of, of the virtues and accomplishments of people from those groups. Um, whereas when they're talking about people from historically advantaged or high status groups, they're often kind of focused more on the kind of um, historical wrongdoing or, or sort of negative attributes. So like uh, whites are perceived as being sort of less racially aware than, you know, things like this. So there's kind of an asymmetry in how they talk about um, high and low status group members. And the training itself is often focused, is, also, is often like the pedagogical goals of the training are often asymmetrical as well, in the sense that they're often focused on correcting mis uh, misperceptions and changing behaviors of people from the high status groups with respect to people from lower historically lower status groups and not the other way around. So it's focused on helping men understand and engage with women better, not with helping women understand and engage with men better. It's helping whites understand and engage with people of color better, not necessarily helping people of color understand whites better and engage with them in a more productive way. So there's this kind of asymmetry where it's kind of focused on the high, high on historically high status groups and that, that can be a problem sometimes. Um, I'll add, well, okay, we can circle back to that. <laughs> but so there's often asymmetry. Um, the, um, the training often solicits employees from different groups to speak about their experiences with harassment and discrimination. So especially people from historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups, it often um, solicits their experiences with of being harassed or discriminated or overlooked and encourages people from high status groups to, um, to think about and re reflect on and kind of uh, sometimes verbalize and apologize for, for times that they have engaged perhaps in harassment or discrimination or a kind of bias or un unfair treatment or ignorant, ignorant things they've done or, or, or said. Um, sometimes the training breaks people into affinity groups for this purposes. So they'll have minorities and women or, or women or you know, wh whoever the historically disadvantaged group, groups are kind of get together and talk together about their experiences um, with harassment and discrimination and stuff without having to worry about um, saying these things necessarily in front of people from the higher status groups and they'll have the people from the higher status groups, you know, again, um, meeting separately from people from the other groups in order to, um, again, just reflect on um, things that they've done wrong maybe or like missed opportunities things they could do better so that sometimes they they separate um sometimes there are role-playing scenarios uh often the training um 
summarizes inequality in the US in general or in the specific sector that they're working in, or sometimes even in the specific institution that they're in, although that's, um, uh, the, and, and the training is framed as a means to address this. Um, sometimes the training also in the process of summarizing sort of general trends in inequality in the US um, ends up wading into kind of um, political stuff say about Trump or Black Lives Matter and policing or, or America's you know, history of racism and discrimination, it, political stuff that's kind of orthogonal to the specific tasks that people are gonna do. Um, we can talk about that and how it can sometimes go awry. Um, but in general, uh, the last few things I'll say is that training tends to be focused on um, hearts and minds and beliefs and, um, uh, and feelings of participants and changing those things under the implicit assumption that this will translate into different behavior. Um, the, the, general, the larger and general operations and structure of the organization are generally left untouched. Uh, that's, that's kind of beyond the scope of the training. Uh, the training, uh, newer training often includes modules on implicit bias or microaggressions or privilege. Um, these latter modules are sometimes um, are, are kind of more controversial, both politically and um, empirically, uh, and can sometimes, and early research suggests that they might be more prone to certain blowback and un unintended harms. And then the last thing I'll say is that diversity training is, tends to be mandatory. It's like overwhelmingly mandatory, um, expected of all, all employees. And that can also um, create, uh, that also has trade-offs. Um, that uh, a lot of companies don't think about as, as fully as maybe they could or should. Great, Musa, that's a, that's a really comprehensive list. And I have my, I don't know, I guess you can't see it, maybe the, the lighting's off, but I have a list of nine, nine characteristics of, of uh, I guess, the standard model of diversity training. Um, I'm not sure if I should read them out, but either way, um, some of them, just, just to play devil's advocate, what's what's wrong what's you know legal compliance with anti-discrimination laws okay i think that, that that sounds like a good thing positive statements about diversity conflict avoidance strategies learning about the the um a, you know a group that maybe you don't know a lot about that might be marginalized or racialized or alienate feel feelings of you know alienation um giving voice to employees who might have diverse experiences um uh, giving a general representation of, of, the in, of the inequality that characterizes certain economic sectors of the specific organization, um, being anti-Trump, right? Of course, these are all these are all good things, right? Like um, I say that I say that in um, tongue in cheek. Um, engaging with anti-bias, right? Having people sort of articulate and reflect on their heart, their their what's in their what's in their hearts, what's in their minds, feelings, um, and also the mandatory component not letting people opt out of something that clearly is so important right so what what's wrong why th this should this this sounds to me like a no-brainer that this should be effective this should be productive for organizational culture um what am i missing here what what am i not seeing and not understanding about why this thing why why diversity training as you've laid out um is so problematic and could be so corrosive and toxic for organizational culture. Yeah, absolutely. And what, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll lead by saying is that, you know, there are uh, part of the reason why diversity training is um, so prominent and so, um, and, and, and remains so uh, popular, despite the fact that there's not, um, again, that uh, there's not a lot of training, I mean, not a lot of evidence that it's effective at least part of the reason why people continue to reach for this is because they have real organizational like needs and goals that the training is supposed to be filling right so as you said like what's wrong you know um there are real needs there um that that organizations have um and and the goals that of, of the training are not necessarily like bad in fact they're often um uh uh, uh you know uh, both praiseworthy and like practically important <laughs> uh, and so the, the, the question is not the goals, it's, it's, it's this question of like, does this tool uh, help us achieve those goals, right? And, um, and with respect to that question, 
So some of the ways that the training goes awry, um, I'll, I'll, I can tick through a few of them. Um, so on the one, so one 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 thing that um, can happen a lot of times that training can reinforce biases that people have. So, um, so this can happen in a few ways. Uh, one, because uh, so for instance, there's this problem sometimes where, uh, like, if I tell you don't think of an elephant, like, what the first thing you'll do is <laughs> you're actually increasing the salience or prominence of the very thing that you're trying to suppress, right? And so this is one issue is that um, uh, by focusing on say stereotypes or negative perceptions that people hold about, um, you can actually render those very ideas more salient in people's minds um, than, than they were. Sometimes you can even um, add new ones. So say you don't have, you don't know a lot of people who are um, uh, transgender and, um, and you're doing training on, on, um, sex, on, on sexuality and diversity and sexuality, and they go through a bunch of stereotypes about transgender people. Now, if you don't have, if you didn't have stereotypes before, uh, before this training, strong stereotypes, because you didn't have, like a lot of times after the training, after being told about these sort of stereotypes that people hold, sometimes the training can actually implant stereotypes in people that they didn't have before. Um, uh, and um, so this is, so this is one issue is it can make, again, some of these things more salient and plant new, stereoty uh, new stereotypes. Um, sometimes uh, um, there are kind of tensions where like, sometimes when they focus on describing people of different groups, they can like um, essentialize different groups in a way that leads to them getting pigeonholed more. Oh, so, you know, um, so these people are like this, which means they should be, you know, so let's slot them in here in the organization or whatever. So it can, it can actually lead to people getting pigeonholed more to the extent that people, to, to the extent that the training inadvertently essentializes the groups and trying to sort of um, describe them. Um, and um, oftentimes uh, the training can even, um, so that, that's one issue is that it can like reinforce biases. Another issue is that it can sometimes increase biased behavior um, and increase minority turnover. And the, the reasons this can happen uh, is there's a few, a, few, a few ways. So one is when the, when the organization itself does something like diversity training or anti-bias training, it's like a signal um, that's received by both the employees uh, of from historically advantaged groups and employees of historically disadvantaged groups. They both get the same signal and that signal is this is an institution that cares about these things and is committed to doing something. This is not an organization that tolerates harassment and discrimination, things like this. Okay, to the extent that people internalize this understanding of their organization, it can actually lead to more biased behavior and less, so, so um, because, so, so for instance, um, it can lead them to take complaints less seriously from people from, um, so, so if a black person in an organization says I've been discriminated against, white employees, white colleagues are less likely to take that seriously, ironically, after, after training or after the uh, organization uh, makes a statement, like in the wake of George Floyd's killing or things like this, after they do these kind of big symbolic gestures towards equality, it can lead um, people from high status groups to take complaints from minorities less seriously. What do you mean you're discriminated against? This is a company that's very committed to diversity and inclusion, whatever. And it can lead, on the other hand, it can lead people from the historically disadvantaged group to feel the same way, to question whether or not they're actually being discriminated against. Is it just me? Am I being unreasonable? After all, this is an organization that cares about, right? And so they can end up not reporting uh, or not confronting some of these problems precisely as a result of the training, as a result of feeling that their organization is fair. But then the problems don't get solved and they often fester and grow worse and employees, again, can sometimes treat people more in a more biased way. And so you can end up with higher turnover and more discrimination as a result of these kind of symbolic sig signals that the company is committed to, um, to doing something. Uh, and so that's one, that's another way it can go awry. Um, one way that it can go, uh, like one, one other sort of negative consequence the training can have sometimes is it can 
alienate people from high status group and, and kind of reduce morale and cooperation between across different groups. Um, so, and this can happen in a few ways. So for one, um, that, that asymmetry I mentioned where, where um, a lot of the training is focused on members of high status groups and sort of things that they do wrong and ways that they go awry and the kind of blind spots that they have um, and where the kind of, where so, so say uh, whites um, and men are, are, are depicted as like oppressive or, or kind of um, just kind of um, obstinate, like not able to see um, from, you know, things like this, um, careless, um, even when they don't suggest that they're like evil or malignant or things like that, you know, but still they just seem kind of like incompetent, socially incompetent, <laughs> um, but, but people from low status groups are not described that way. And uh, they're often described in overwhelmingly positive terms. And this asymmetry is often noticed by people who take part in the training and it leads them to feel kind of resentful. So people who are whites or men or whatever feel like they're getting attacked, feel like, um, and, and that, that can actually increase resentment and lead them to feel that like actually they're not valued in the organization, that the organization only cares about women or minorities or whatever and doesn't care about people like them. Um, and, uh, and so that so that can like increase alienation from people of high status groups, and to the extent that some of the training is focused on ways that people can um, uh, can uh, is focused on compliance on things like if you do this, then these are the kind of punishments that you could face. These are the kind of disciplinary procedures. These are the rules you have to follow the rules, or even to the extent that they focus on things like um, avoiding offense. Uh, and, and kind of portray it as sometimes in teaching people how to avoid offense, how to avoid offending people from different groups, they actually make it seem like people from historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups are these really fragile people who if you say the, like, the wrong thing, even completely un inadvertently, you'll just devastate them. And they'll, they're likely to respond in a really aggressive way, right? It can, can inadvertently convey this impression that people from historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups are these fragile people that you have to um, treat with kid gloves or walk on eggshells around them. And one of the ways that people um, from historically um, advantaged groups tend to respond to that perception to the extent that they walk away from the training feeling that way, they just avoid working with those people. <laughs> so they, they just focus more, like if, if uh, you know, you just focus on working with other white people or with other men so you don't have to worry about inadvertently create, you know, um, so this is one one um, kind of inadvertent effect of the training sometimes is insofar as people from historically marginalized groups are depicted as, or inadvertently usually, but insofar as people walk away from the training thinking that people from these uh, other groups are easily offended, um, can be inadvertently, and that, you know, inadvertent things can just devastate them and things like this, um, they're less likely to work across groups. They just try to avoid people from, from other backgrounds. Um, training can actually normalize bias. So some of the training, you know, suggests, argues that um, uh, basically, you know, different forms of bias and discrimination are unconscious. So they're not amenable to, our, to, our, to us consciously um, doing anything about them and that they're always there, that you'll always have them no matter what you will always be right. And so this can have two kind of consequences. On the one hand, it can lead to a kind of nihilism among a lot of people um, to think that like, oh, well, uh, there's nothing I can do about it. So, you know, why do something about it? like what, you know, it, they, it creates this feeling of helpless, helplessness that leads to a kind of nihilism. And then for other people, it can actually normalize it, right? So if it's if it's something that everyone does, actually, if everyone is discriminating, if everyone is biased, then if I'm biased or discriminatory, there's actually it's actually not deviant or unusual or whatever. It's something that literally everyone does. They just told us everyone does it. It's perfectly normal, right? Um, and so uh, and so this can be it can actually normalize the very kind of um, discriminatory behaviors that they're trying to um, help people avoid. And I'll I'll just give two other. Uh, uh, examples of things that can um, happen sometimes. So 
Um, in some cases, uh, so for instance, teaching people about uh, privilege and because um, again, a lot of contemporary fake um, training focuses on privilege. There was a study that um, just came out evaluating the efficacy of those training programs. And what it found is that teaching people about say white privilege doesn't tend to make people feel any better or treat people from historically disadvantaged groups any differently. What it does lead them to do is feel more condescension towards people from historically advantaged groups who are, who are, who are not successful. So it doesn't, like, so for instance, teaching people about white privilege doesn't make people feel better about African Americans or treat African Americans any differently. It does lead them to think if you're poor and white, you deserve it for making bad use of your privilege. Um, so I have no concern for you. Poor white, if you're suffering and you're white, you deserve it. If you're suffering and you're male, you deserve it. Um, and so that that can actually um, sort of increase um, antipathy towards people rather than uh, um, rather than making them feel better, cooperate more across different lines. And so, so there are all sorts of these kinds of things. Oh, and then the last thing, mandatory training. The problem with making training mandatory is um, there's two there's two big problems associated with that in the literature. Uh, one of them is that it can lead people to approach the training in an adversarial way. So they go into the training already, you know, uh, hostile um, and, um, and in a bad mood about it. And that makes it difficult for them to learn the things that they're supposed to learn um, and, and to approach the training in a good way because they're, they're adversarial going into it. Um, and then the other problem is it kind of denies people's agency. So if people are opting into the training, then they're they're you know then they're approaching it not as someone who's dragged kicking and screaming, but like, hey, I'm here because I want to be because I want to be part of the solution. This is something I care about. This is something I'm gonna you know et cetera. So you're approaching it in that kind of more agentic um, way, which makes you more likely to actually do something with the training when you get out. And I guess, actually, I'll, I will say one more thing about where the training goes awry, is that often, because it's relevant for like how the training could be better, is that often the training isn't really indexed to anyone's particular jobs or particular, or, you know, so it's, it's not even clear sometimes people will walk out of the training kind of committed to doing something, um, but not really sure what they can do, like what as I'm going about my job, my specific job, what can I change in my day to day routines concretely, right, to address some of these problems, it's often not clear by the time people exit training, there's kind of a general commitment and kind of a general sentiment, kind of general things, but like it's less clear in my specific organization, in my specific job, what are concrete things, right, um, and that's that's one um, limitation that leads people to, to not see the value of the training or in any case to not really put it to use in a meaningful way. Okay, so Musa, you've made um, like an, an overwhelming case against diversity training. And, and I should say, we're, we're here, we're not advocating any one line, go out, everyone here, do your own research, read Musa's, read criticisms of Musa's work to the extent that it's out there. Um, but okay, let, let's, let's say we buy your argument. Right, diversity training, as 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 commonly practiced, is not just ineffective but toxic. Increases rates of bias, um, creates disincentives for those who think they've been or who have been legitimately victimized to actually feel like they have, and undermines their chances of of reporting it. So there's a whole litany of of issues you've listed, and I, and I'm running out of paper here, um, but. Musa, we, if you put your HR hat on, um, okay, you're, you're a sociologist, you're an academic, um, but if you pretend you're an HR professional, knowing what you now know, and if you were tasked with designing your own diversity program, what do you do? What are the top three, four, or five things that, you know, you're, you're, the, you're the benevolent dictator here. You can do whatever you want, unlimited resources. What would you, what are some sort of, really sort of the top top things that you would 
uh, top characteristics of your diversity program? What would they be? Sure. So I'll, I'll say at the top that there are, um, there are things that people can do to enhance diversity um, and inclusion in organizations um, that don't, that are kind of separate from diversity training um, that have been shown to be a little bit more effective. A lot of the things that people do um, that are beyond the training are also ineffective. And, and actually Dobbin and his co-author Alexandra Kalev do a lot of work showing how some of these other things as well, like grievance procedures and things like this often backfire as well. Um, but there are some, some things other than training that people can do that are effective. Um, uh, but, but if I was just going to zero in on training and how we can do the training differently and better. Um, so there, there are a few things. So for one, uh, again, I, th I think one thing that's super important is to um, index training to people's specific roles within the organization, specific tasks and specific goals. So often, um, again, diversity training is oriented around these kind of huge goals that are not plausibly achievable through the mechanism of training. So things like if eliminating racism or sexism or you know, um, promoting inequality in the broader US society and things like, like that's just beyond the scope of what an organizational training session could plausibly achieve, right? Um, and so if you're aiming for goals that you can't realize, then you're doomed to fail, obviously. Um, and so, uh, and, and also again, when the training is overly broad or vague, it can be not clear how people can actually use the things that they're learning practically in their, in their own environment. So um, the training should be tightly indexed to specific organizational objectives, the specific tasks that different team members are responsible for. So this can help them see the relevance of the training as well. So that, to, so it eliminates the sense of why am I here? This is a waste of time. They can more concretely see the relevance of the training and they can operationalize it like in a more practical way. Um, and, uh, and, and as part of that, a training should avoid things that are kind of orthogonal to the, um, uh, uh, to, to kind of people achieving these concrete tasks in the workplace. So this isn't the place, you know, the training shouldn't be a place to litigate Trump or Black Lives Matter or um, the 1619 project and whether or not America was founded fundamentally on slavery and things like, like that's kind of stuff um, is not really the kind of thing that, you know, should be, that really should have a place. And, and it makes things needlessly controversial. And again, distracts, detracts from people's ability to operationalize the training in a practical way and in a concrete way in their specific roles. Um, Another thing is that diversity training should be integrated into more general employee development. So rather than it being a standalone thing, it should be just part of your regular training. So if you're training people to be a manager, for instance, guess what? Avoiding nepotism or bias um, in, in, in how you give assignments and hiring and promotion, like that's not like some kind of separate diversity thing. That's just part of being a good manager, <laughs> like if being an effective manager is right. And so to the extent that um, that the training is focused on like, how do you avoid bias and whatever, but folding that into their sort of general employee development rather than being a freestanding thing, um, that again can help make it more concrete, can help it make it easier to operationalize and can reduce some of the kind of um, adversarial adversarialism that people have with like the kind of freestanding mandatory training as it's currently practiced. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to that. To just, um, one, uh, uh, another thing is that um, things like racism, uh, sexism, um, and things like that should be discussed as kind of as, as general cognitive trends rather than unique pathologies of like whites or, or men. So for instance, um, people generally gravitate towards other people who are like them and they tend to hold negative attitudes and demonstrate a willingness to discriminate against people who are different from themselves. This is a general, people make snap judgments about others based on how they present themselves, the context of the counter, their own life experiences and all of this. People prefer data which flatters what they already believe and they're skeptical of things that challenge their priors. These are general cognitive tendencies that have nothing to do with whites or men or heterosexuals. And um, they're just general features of human cognition. Um, 
And so there are all these studies that show that, you know, um, uh, people who are um, African-American prefer to hire or more likely to hire and promote other African-Americans. People who are Korean are more likely to hire and promote other Koreans. People who are Muslim are more likely to hire and promote other Muslims. People who are Mormons, people who are LGBTQ are more likely to hire and promote. People who are women are more, people who graduate from Columbia are more likely to favor other people from Columbia. This is a general cognitive tendency. It has nothing to do with America's history of um, uh, slavery or anything like that. Again, so you don't even need to get into that to talk about, you know, how we have, um, uh, how, how we have, uh, and so to the extent that we that that it's framed as this kind of general cognitive tendency this this does a couple of things so one it it alien, it prevents this kind of alienation that people feel of that they're being kind of singled out as unique um as uniquely depraved or something like this um it helps eliminate the asymmetry that that I talked about where the training is usually focused on helping people from high, from say helping men engage with women but not with helping women engage with men. Um, if you only focus on one side, on correcting misperceptions and negative attitudes on one side, but the other side continues to have negative attitudes and, mis and, and misperceptions. And in fact, sometimes the training, you know, people from um, historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups will exit the training with even more negative perceptions about people from, then you'll still have, um, right? So you really have to treat both sides of the equation if you want people to be working together, right? You can't just treat one and then not the other or make things even worse on this side. Um, so, um, so focusing on these general cognitive tendencies that people have, and then talking, then you can drill in to how these general cognitive tendencies that we have can tend to express themselves in terms of race uh, along racial lines or along gender lines Right, so these are general cognitive tendencies that can express themselves in these concrete ways that are problematic. And then you can talk about how, okay, so these general tendencies to associate with people like ourselves, they often express themselves along gender lines. Here's why that can be, you know, et cetera. People don't feel attacked in that way, again. Um, and, uh, and it's a more symmetrical approach. Um, and again, it doesn't, it, it, and it doesn't start from the assumption again that that minorities are kind of different kinds of beings and whites or men are different kinds of et cetera. Um, uh, that you know dominant groups are depraved and all of this. Okay, another thing is that the training should be about managing rather than avoiding conflict. So um, conflict and misunderstanding are basically inevitable when you have people of different backgrounds and worldviews, different interests and priorities different plans and expectations, and you're folding them into one organization to pursue some common goal when there's deadlines and pressure and a lot at stake in terms of who gets hired and promoted. Like in that kind of a situation, there's gonna be conflict. There's gonna be conflict. There's no way misunderstandings will happen, conflicts will happen. And to the extent that training is, is aimed at avoiding conflict, at suppressing conflict, often that can make things worse. So, you know, things that people have, you know, um, problems that people have don't get addressed. They just kind of hold them in and, and they, they try to bury them and suppress them. And then that can lead to, so problems go unaddressed. And then eventually they often explode into something far worse than if people, um, so if you just, if instead of that, you give people tools to, um, to engage in, to, to like lean into conflict more effectively, to have good working relationships in spite of misunderstandings, in spite of conflict, to work through conflict rather than to kind of avoid the conflict. Um, and this is a problem because a lot of employers, what they really want actually is peace. They don't want to be bothered. They don't want to, um, so they're, they're looking for um, how can we, you know, but actually in some ways kind of leaning into conflict, um, leaning into that as inevitable, that conflicts and misunderstandings will happen. Here's how you can, you know, engage in conflict more effectively, more productively, more constructively, and actually sometimes leave conflict, you know, exit conflicts with a better understanding, with a stronger working relationship, with more trust, et cetera, than you had beforehand. Um, that should be the goal. So um, managing conflict rather than avoiding conflict. And then um, uh, the last thing I'll say is that, uh, so again, I, I, diversity training should probably not be standalone, um, but to the extent that they have standalone diversity training, instead it should be, again, indexed to particular roles and particular jobs. And this gives people multiple touch points, I'll add too. So like, so for instance, um, 
as in, when you first start in the organization, you have one role, you're given training that's kind of indexed to the specific job you have that's related to diversity and inclusion, but, but, but talking about it as part of your job doing this role. And then if you get promoted to another one, then part of your training to be, say, a manager instead of what you were doing before will include more training about how, as a manager, here, you know, here's how you can avoid bias and discrimination and things like that. So you get, you actually end up with multiple touch points of like, and, and again, they're more practically oriented and they're not these kind of weird adversarial things. But to the extent that you do kind of standalone training that's on diversity per se, that's on like sexism per se, or racism per se, or, or whatever, that's kind of separate from, then that kind of training should be um, optional rather than mandatory. And you can provide people with incentives, with like light incentives to participate. So if you participate in this training, you can take the rest of the day off or something, you know, some kind of mild incentive. Um, uh, that kind of thing can um, encourage people, to, again, to, to, to enter into the training with a completely different mindset and to be able to receive the training in a different way and to view themselves as, oh, okay, and the last thing, two last things, okay. Two last things and really the end. Um, a lot of the training should be focused on kind of uh, emphasizing rather than focusing, start rather than leading with the differences that people have. Um, they should start by focusing on superordinate identities, on shared values, on shared goals, um, and build this kind of superordinate identity first. And then you can get into the differences, right? So if you're coming from this place of, uh, of, of, of common uh, of common ground, um, then it's easier to get into the differences with in, in, without feeling threatened, without feeling um, uh, uh, without feeling adversarial, without right. So if you so lead with the build common ground first, and then get into the differences rather than kind of leading with the differences and then hoping that to somehow achieve common ground. Going that path is much more difficult than leading with common ground and going into differences. Okay, so that's. Um, and then, uh, oh, and then the last thing to, is to focus on 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 agency to like really um, to really make people feel like they have power, like they like they can do something, like this is something that is within their control, and um, to have them exit um, the training feeling like um, these are there are concrete things that I can do to make this situation better, um, practical things. Like not things involving searching in my heart and mind, but like I can go to work tomorrow, and these are some practical things that I can do that will improve the situation. Um, like so, so leaning into people's efficacy and giving them practical tools and frameworks that they can use um, is uh, is super important to have the training actually do something closer to what it's like supposed to do. Um, okay, Musa, that, that's an awesome list. Um... What I'm wondering about, and I, and I have my list here, so for anyone's interested, I guess maybe I could try to type it up, but I would just send you to Musa's better, uh, more, more impressive work. The last thing I'd ask you is, okay, so you've told me the, the problems with diversity training as sort of rolled out in, in the standard way. You've, you've provided me with, I think, what I have nine practical characteristics that I could sort of embed in my diversity initiatives. What, what, what are the obstacles? I mean, a lot of what you say makes a ton of sense. It's logical, it's, 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 it's intuitive. Um, it's consistent with other sort of psychological mental health themes that we all talk about, that we value. Um, what obstacles am I likely to face as an HR professional trying to roll your model out within an organization? Is there something that I need to be aware of when I try to promote this alternative you're suggesting? Yeah, so I mean, one, th one thing that's um, pretty, uh, well, like one pretty straightforwardly challenging thing off the go is that to the extent that you're indexing training more specifically to people's specific jobs and their specific roles and specific tasks they have to confront, that's, that requires a lot more development up front than if you have a one size fits all training, you just get everyone in a room, you have them do it, and you move on, right? So, so there's a, a lot more, um, it's a lot more complex to develop training that's oriented towards specific, everyone's specific goals and, and, and specific tasks and specific things within an organization. 
Um, so that's, that's one, and this is probably one reason why even though there's abundant research that this more tailored approach is more effective, people continue to do the one size fits all thing, it's because the one size fits all thing is easy. You fly someone out, you sit everyone in a room, you do it, you can check the box and move on with your life. But, but so, and so this is the, um, and so part of the question or part of the tension is like, what's the priority for organizations and companies, right? So if the prior, if the main priority for the organization and company is, I, I need to check this, I, like I need to do this PR thing, I need to do this legal compliance thing, I need to, you know, um, then then the one size fits all thing, there's not actually a strong incentive to, I mean, you can you can improve productivity and like there, there, are, there are reasons why you would still wanna, but like if, if the main thing that you're concerned about is just avoiding lawsuits and bad press, and um, and 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 attracting and rec recruiting the kind of people that you're um, uh, that you're interested in, then um, you can do a lot of that kind of symbolic stuff um, with a one size fits all approach. And so this so this is so one challenge off the bat is that it's it's a little more demanding to develop it up front. But the nice thing is the development costs are like once you once you set it up in the first place, like once you have a good um, diversity uh once you have folded this into like say training for managers or whatever um it, you don't have to reinvent the wheel constantly right so it's 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 a big upfront cost it's a big in, upfront investment in terms of time in terms of labor in terms of all this kind of stuff um but uh but it but it you know persists it's not an it's not an investment that you constantly have once you get it up and running maintaining it and kind of re retooling it and and expanding it and all of that kind of stuff is is easier than the upfront thing, right? Okay, so that's one challenge. Um, another challenge is just that um, there's this pr there's this problem for a lot of these things where no one wants to be the first person to do to do a lot of these organizational. <laughs> changes. And instead, what people tend to do, there's this phenomenon, what's it's called institutional isomorphism. So people tend to copy their peers. They like, what should I do? Well, what are my peers doing? And especially, what are my high status peers doing? So if you're a university and you're trying to decide what should, how should we structure our training program? What they, the first question that a lot of universities ask is, well, what's Harvard doing, right? So if Harvard is doing it this way, then we're going to do it that way, um, rather than, you know, um, so a lot of organizations are, and there's two reasons why this, uh, there's a few reasons why this kind of conservative approach prevails. Um, one is that sometimes in court, um, when you're getting sued and whatever, what judges look to a lot of times is, are you doing, are you complying with, are you doing the same thing as your peers? So if everyone else is doing this thing and you're not doing that thing, then you can look weird. And that can be a problem for you sometimes in court or whatever. Um, and so that's, that's one reason. Um, but another reason too, is like people like to emulate, um, emulate successful models, right? So if, if Harvard is doing it, um, and say sticking with the university training modules example. So if Harvard is doing it, um, and say I'm the, um, say I'm university of Arizona, which is where I, uh, which is school I graduated from. So if you're, <laughs> if Harvard is doing it, um, like in, in your University of Arizona, like everyone wants to be more like Harvard. And so to the extent that you can say, well, look, we've adopted this thing that Harvard you know, adopted rather than, well, we're pioneering this new thing based on the evidence. <laughs> um, that second thing is a lot less compelling than, hey, look, we got the same people that Harvard got to give our, right? Um, and so, so overcoming this kind of institutional isomorphism and this kind of copying of peers is another challenge. Yeah, that's a really so there is a there is a sort of a courage component to sort of be that be that outlier. Um, we're we're up we're already past time, but Musa, I'm wondering if you might be willing to take one question from the audience from from Brad. He has his hand up. Is that that's okay with you? Okay, Brad, go for it. Yeah. Thanks, Musa. Thanks so much for a really uh, insightful session. Uh, lots of really interesting insights. I'm curious, what's your take on, because there are two elements, right? So one is 
when you think of it from a workplace, like how do we manage diversity equity or how do we nurture or cultivate and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion more constructively within our organizations so we're operating as more honorable organizations in the direction of our objectives, right? Because like you mentioned, like that's a key piece. And then there's the other element of us as community and society, just in general, like how do we continue to evolve from here? What's your take on factoring or, or making the focus on the amazing world that's a, ahead of us when we work together or when we tap into diversity or when and and when we 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 truly make that happen like one simple example that i have from the academic world i think this would be an interesting one i don't know if anybody's seen this movie called the man who knew infinity uh, it's a beautiful story of a, a math professor from oxford university um, and a mathematician from India, from the south part of India, who had a very modest education and their journey of how they created some amazing work together that, interestingly enough, that today NASA is using to understand black holes in the universe. Like, that's, the, that's what their work produced. Like, you know, uh, my hope is that we see stuff like this happening in organizations all over the place, and that becomes the motivation or, you know, of what can happen, number one. Number two, it, it, it's, it makes this world a more beautiful place. Like how cool would it be for us to look back 15, 20 years from now and say, you know, we had a hand in playing in, in, in moving society forward in a more healthy and constructive way. So I'm just curious. I hope I didn't digress too much with that question. No, yeah, so I think- no, um, I'm sorry, miss I could before you jump in, can I, let me just layer on one more one more question from Naya. I realized I missed one in the chat, if that's okay. So keep those thoughts in your head. Naya, did you want to ask your question? Sorry for missing it earlier. It's okay. I actually had a second question I just sent to Mike because I have to hop off. So feel yeah. free to ask the question and then I will watch the recording because I'm really interested in all of your answers. Okay. <laughs> let me scroll up. So Naya is was asking, um, hmm. now I have to interpret on the go here. She writes, I'll literally just read it. Does that also lead to people expecting the marginalized group to educate slash shoulder the work, keeping the company work relationship in a positive, diverse place? Um, I'm not sure that that, that Naya was referring to at that moment of our conversation, but maybe not, Musa, you can speak briefly to um, some of the, the theme that she's speaking to there about the role that the marginalized, the, the individual from the marginalized group themselves has to, has to play in, in promoting diversity in their organization. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, to address them in order, uh, I'll, I'll go with Brett. So, so yeah, so the, um, in the same way that it's helpful to focus on kind of superordinate identities first and to prioritize those before you get into differences, I think it's also valuable and, uh, and important. Um, so again, like a lot of training is focused on, on how things go bad, on, on where things go awry, on, on kind of um, punishments and sanctions and um, blow ups and um, compliance and things like this, right? Uh, so it's kind of the, the whole valence of it is negative. And, and, it's, and, and again, a, a lot of it, even people walk away from the training feeling like there's nothing that they can even do about some of these problems, right? So focusing more on, on, the, on the positive, on the possibilities, on the kinds of things that we're capable of when we work together, for the same reason that focusing on superordinate groups um, and superordinate goals and superordinate values is important, I think focusing on these kinds of positive possibilities, leading with those um, is, is kind of, is gonna be more, uh, more conducive to getting people to really internalize this stuff and really want to do it and want to, to be part of it and want to operationalize it in their, rather than focused on like, if you don't do this, there's going to be all of these problems. These people are going to hate you. You could get fired. These sanctions could happen. It could be a PR nightmare, right? So rather than focusing on these kind of negative things um, and leading with those, I think, I think you're absolutely right that, that sort of leading uh, and, and trying to emphasize the kind of possibilities that can be opened up when we uh, is 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 um, valuable. Um, uh, on the on this question of 
um, people from historically uh, marginalized and disadvantaged groups and the kind of um, burden that they that they often are ex are um, are uh, expected or compelled to carry in order to make facilitation uh, in order to come in. Um, so I mean, there's definitely a case. So for instance, um, I mean, it definitely is the case. For instance, that with respect to women and men, for instance, there are all these studies that show that women tend to do a lot more um, cognitive and emotional labor than men to sort of preserve relationships and things like this. So there are kind of um, inequities that are that are often present um, uh, in, in in some of these um, relationships. And uh, one one way that the training goes awry that that the sort of current approach to training goes awry sometimes though is um, is that if you focus like if the focus is that we should that we should all that we can all be more that you know um, that we can all be more um, careful, like with respect to cognitive or emotional labor, right? And instead of emphasis, instead of focusing on how other people uh, who are not typically engaging in this labor, um, uh, engaging in this cognitive work, instead of helping them understand this work, this kind of cognitive labor that they're not doing and how they can engage with it. If the emphasis is on like these people shouldn't have to do this, like if it's this kind of asymmetrical thing. So these people shouldn't have to do the, have been traditionally burdened with the labor and they shouldn't have to do it anymore. And these people are privileged and they should be forced to do more of this, right? So if it's this kind of adversarial um, approach um, and this kind of asymmetrical approach where the goal isn't to make everyone have this, um, isn't to encourage these other people to do this emotional labor, um, uh, for, you know, in using these other people as an exemplar. So, you know, this is, you know, um, rather than saying men are bad uh, and and um, and women are good and and so for instance sticking with this example or that men should do this other stuff and women shouldn't have to do this other stuff if the focus was more on highlighting the exemplars so here's one way here's one thing that women often contribute to organizations um, and that we can look to um, to help um, to help improve organizations and here's how men who who often kind of don't think about this stuff can right so Focusing on highlighting exemplars rather than this kind of um, adversarial contrast drawing um, can be uh, can be a more effective approach to um, to uh, both recognizing and addressing this kind of um, unequal weight that people carry. And I'll, and I'll add, but one thing that's that that's kind of unavoidable and that's uncomfortable but unavoidable. Is that um, is that people from historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups like um, there is a burden, but that that, that we that that is carried some there is additional labor that that um, we do something, but but there's not a way around it really like so so there's not a way again so a lot of the training as it's currently developed is focused on correcting misperceptions of people from high status groups not low status groups and that can actually be a problem right so exempting people from historically marginalized and disadvantaged groups from worrying about understanding people from this other group or changing how they uh, interact with people, like um, or how they think about people from the historically advantaged group, only focusing on people from that group. That actually can sometimes exacerbate the problem and make things worse and whatever. And so there's this kind of temptation on the one hand to say, well, we don't think that people from the low status group should have to accommodate people from, they shouldn't have to learn about people from this group, they shouldn't have to, right? Whatever, you know, just practically speaking, um, it's actually important to be symmetrical in this way. Both both groups will need to um, change, will probably need to change and understand the other more um, in order for them to work together more practically, right? That's just, that's just a practical reality. It's an uncomfortable reality, like in a, in a ideal world, maybe, you know, that wouldn't be the case and the onus would be purely on people from historically advantaged groups, but, um, but that's just practically speaking, that's not the reality we live in. Uh, Musa, thank you so much. When can we expect the launching of your HR consultancy?
career? I know you're you're a budding public intellectual, but when when are you going to get into consulting? Or, or or no, sorry. When you do, just let us know. Okay. 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 <laughs> Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Musa, for all your, your, your research, your, your thoughtfulness, uh, your, your ability to explain complicated, important topics in such a clear way. Um, I've really benefited from this talk. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience who stuck around. If you didn't stick around, thank you for, for showing up for as long as you did. Um, so I hope you took something out of this. I hope you took some practical insights that you could bring to your own organization. Um, we're, we're back live at, uh, at 1 30 with Dr. Neil Rothenberg on mindfulness in, in the workplace. So, so join us for that. Again, a big thank you to Musa Al Garbi. Please check out his website, his work for the Heterodox Academy, and his new book with Princeton University Press. It should be great. Thank you again to everyone. Musa, thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you.